Well, I, I mean, I wrote that book, A History of Political Trials, in uh, 2008 because I had written the previous year a history, a, a, an account of the Milosevic trial, of the trial of Slobodan Milosevic, uh, which I wrote shortly after Milosevic died in 2006. And in the preface to that book, I wrote one sentence, which was that uh, although the supporters of these trials say that the indictment of a head of state is... Uh, um, is an unprecedented event in history and it represents a new era of impunity. I said, no, this is not true. Uh, on the contrary, the Milosevic trial is uh, part of a long tradition of uh, heads of state, former heads of state, being put on trial uh, after they have been overthrown and in order to cement uh, the legitimacy of the new regime which overthrew them. Uh, because it is indeed clear that although the phenomenon of international tribunals is modern. The general idea of overthrowing a uh, head of state and then putting him on trial uh, by the new regime is not uh, new at all. On the contrary, it has a history which begins in 1649 with the criminal trial of Charles I of England. That's the first time in history, as far as we know, that uh, a former head of state was put on a put on trial for, uh, for, put into a criminal trial for acts of state committed while he was in office. It was the first occasion when the criminal law was used to prosecute acts of state. The second example was Louis XVI of France. And then uh, you go, there's a long break, just as there's 150 years between Charles I and Louis XVI, then you have a, uh, more than 100 years until the next uh, trials or, and attempted trials after the First World War. And then the process accelerates. Uh, <clears throat> it begins with the indictment of the Kaiser by the Treaty of Versailles. There are trials in Greece in 1922, but it really accelerates after the Second World War. Not just Nuremberg and Tokyo, but also uh, many, many trials are conducted of uh, former heads of state, former heads of government in occupied Europe, on, in previously occupied Europe after the liberation uh, in uh, 1945, 46, 47, and so on. And then, uh, of course, uh, as we get closer to our own day, uh, there's a, a lull after the Second World War, but then the pace, pace picks up again, and uh, it has now exponentially increased with this new fad, this new fashion for international tribunals. Uh, the number of heads of state indicted both by national and by international tribunals has shot up uh, I wrote my book from Charles I to Saddam Hussein because he was the last uh, head of state to have been put on criminal trial when I was writing my book. But since that book came out in 2008, no fewer than 13 other heads of state uh, have been uh, indicted or tried or convicted uh, by in criminal procedures. So we're dealing with a, um, a process which is rapidly accelerating at the moment and I'm a strong critic of it and, I, that, and that's why I wrote the book because when you look at the historical record of these trials you see that they are all without exception rigged. It's an absolutely key point which I have made many times and which I'm very happy to make again now because unfortunately uh, the new international tribunals, the Yugoslav Tribunal, the Rwanda Tribunal, the hybrid tribunals, and of course the ICC, all claim to be the followers of Nuremberg. Nuremberg is specifically invoked, for example, in the statute of the Yugoslav Tribunal. Uh, and uh, generally speaking, uh, the, uh, the reference is always made explicitly or implicitly to Nuremberg and to the horrors of Nazism to justify what is being done today. Uh, there is, however, uh, an absolutely fundamental and radical ideological difference between the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials on the one hand and between the new uh, international tribunals on the other, and it lies in the concept of crimes against peace. The Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals prosecuted the Nazis and the Japanese leaders for cri what they call crimes against peace, in other words, for the crime of um, planning and executing a war of aggression. And they did this because the world had been plunged, the whole world had been plunged into a terrible war which, as we know, had consumed uh, tens of millions of lives. Uh, and they were determined, the authors of the Nuremberg uh, Charter, the London Charter, and uh, the, author, the authors of the Charter of the uh, Tokyo Tribunal, 
were determined to set up, by means of the criminal trial, by means of the trial of the Nazis and the Japanese, a new international system which would effectively make war illegal, except under very restricted circumstances. We know this system very well because we live under it still today, at least on paper. It's the system of the United Nations. War is illegal except in self-defense or except when authorized for peacekeeping purposes by the uh, Security Council. Uh, in the modern international tribunals, by contrast, the concept of crimes against peace is either completely absent or effectively absent. In the Yugoslav tribunals, it is totally absent. It's not mentioned in their charter, in its charter. It's not mentioned in the charter of the Rwanda tribunal either. In the charter of the International Criminal Court, there is, of course, uh, the concept of crimes against peace, but it's been kicked into, into touch uh, uh, as you know, because the ICC has existed already uh, for 10 years uh, and uh, the decision was taken then that it they would only have, only have jurisdiction over crimes against peace when they came to a definition uh, of uh, aggression. This was a completely dishonest political stitch-up, this decision not to exercise jurisdiction. I'm talking about all the tribunals now, not just about the ICC. In the Yugoslav tribunal's case, the claim was made when it was created that it would apply customary international law. There is absolutely no doubt, neither in terms of jurisprudence nor in terms of positive law, that the Nuremberg principles are a part of customary international law. They are because the Nuremberg trials happened and they're widely recognized as a precedent but they are in positive law terms because immediately after the trials, the General Assembly of the United Nations specifically voted to include them as into the corpus of customary international law. It was in 46, I think, 1946. So when the Yugoslav Tribunal said, as it did, that it has no jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, it was quite simply lying. It had been, on the contrary, created in order to have jurisdiction uh, and to apply uh, customary international law, and I repeat, there is no doubt that Nuremberg constitutes a part of customary international law. As for the claim by the International Criminal Court during the first 10 years of its existence that it, has no, it had no jurisdiction because there was no definition of aggression, this again is a political lie. It's either a lie or the people who said it are very stupid and ill-informed, because the issue of defining aggression was discussed during the London Conference, which wrote, which drew up the London Charter for the Nuremberg Tribunal. It was discussed. The Americans said, we can't uh, condemn people for aggression until we have a de definition of the term. To which the Soviet uh, delegate replied, if we start to try and define the concept of aggression, the defendants will die of old age. We know there has been aggression. We are going to condemn it. Moreover, in 1976, I think, I'm not sure of the year, I'll have to look it up, the United Nations General Assembly voted a resolution defining the concept of aggression. So there is a General Assembly, a resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, which is the closest thing you can get to a universally accepted uh, act of international law, or at least an international act, it's not strictly speaking, an act of law, but anyway, it's generally, obviously, a universally accepted act, a resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, which defines the concept of aggression. So <clears throat> the ICC had absolutely no excuse for not uh, uh, activating that article in its, in its statute which gives it jurisdiction over the crime against aggression. Now, that argument is a legal argument, my argument, the one I've just presented. It's a leak. I'm explaining to you the law and I'm attacking the fact that this law has not been applied. There is another aspect to this which is much more serious and is, makes me a radical critic of these tribunals. It is that not only do these tribunals not condemn aggression, not only do they not, do not, not only do they say they don't have jurisdiction over aggression, but they actually facilitate it by their actions. They facilitate it by their actions because they, to put it very simply, act 
they march in lockstep with the powerful Western states. They take the same view of the conflicts that they get interested in as the powerful Western states do. In the case of Kosovo, for example, the indictment of Milosevic was issued as NATO's bombs were falling on Yugoslavia. So you had a complete harmony, a total 100% harmony of interests, of interest between the uh, NATO, which is a military alliance, and the Yugoslav tribunal. They had the same enemy. The Yugoslav tribunal's indictment uh, strengthened NATO's case for war when it came. Uh, just as uh, in uh, 2011, the uh, International Criminal Court moved to indict uh, Gbagbo uh, just as uh, the Western powers uh, were uh, uh, voting their resolutions in March 2011, justifying intervention in that country in the name of uh, so-called humanitarian causes. And we see systematically, I've, those are two examples, but the same is true of Libya, which as you know occurred at the same time as the Ivory Coast. On the 17th of March 2011, the Security Council voted uh, itself or voted for NATO the right to um, take all necessary means to protect civilians in Libya. The International Criminal Court issued its indictment against Gaddafi within a matter of days after that. So it's exactly like the Kosovo case. And because these tribunals concentrate uh, in their propaganda, and I'll come back later if I have time to this notion of propaganda, they concentrate in their indictments on the same abuses being allegedly committed by the same people uh, as those which the Western powers say they are trying to prevent. They are the ideological handmaidens of the West's own aggressions against these respective countries. There's been a tendency in the last 20 years, since really I think since the end of the Cold War, to give more and more power to international organisations. And we see this across the board, not just in international criminal law, but in all kinds of areas. We've seen it in the European Union with the very rapid centralisation of power in Brussels and in Frankfurt, the creation of the Euro, the various treaties that have been signed over the last 20 years. We saw it in the 90s with the creation of the World Trade Organization, which replaced the old GATT round of trade talks. Uh, we see it in the proliferation of international tribunals. We see it in NATO's new strategic concepts, which give NATO supranational powers. And we see it, above all, in the very dramatic increase of United Nations Security Council resolutions, in the number of resolutions. If you plot a graph, uh, showing the number of United Nations uh, Security Council resolutions since the creation of the United Nations in 1945. The graph goes like that and takes off in 1991 at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, there is a r very rapid increase in the number of resolutions. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, there would have been no more than, uh, I haven't got the figures in my head, but there might have been uh, 10 or, or or, or 20 uh, at most resolutions a year. Now you have hundreds of them. So there is an inflation, if you like, in uh, Security Council resolutions. So this is a big issue. Uh, the issue, the specific issue of the Security Council is a, is a whole subject in itself. But there has been a general increase in the power of these bodies. And the idea is, and it's, it's, uh, you hear it, as I say, very often in the European Union, but not only in the European Union, in all kinds of contexts. The idea is that we live in a globalized world, nation states are interdependent, uh, so they, their, their national power has no meaning anymore and therefore power must be transferred to international bodies. Because nation states, they abuse their power, they commit terrible uh, violations against their populations and there really needs to be an end to impunity and international monitoring of this, that and the other. Um, I forgot to mention the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is an yet another example of, these, uh, prolif of, of this proliferation of international bodies. Um, in the case of, uh, in all these cases, but particularly in the case of international criminal tribunals, there is an extremely important constitutional flaw in this argument. And it is very simply uh, that when you wield power, 
as you do in a criminal tribunal. A criminal tribunal is almost the, the, one of the most perfect expressions of state power because when a person is convicted, he is deprived of his liberty, he is subject to, uh, to violence. I mean, even if we're not talking about capital or corporal punishment, he is physically taken and put in a, uh, a, a cell, a prison cell, and he is physically kept there until uh, such time as his sentence comes to an end. Uh, this is the most, uh, I would say, existential expression of state power. There, there, is, there is almost no, apart from, of course, the other... Uh, wielding of violence which comes in warfare. These are the two core functions of a state, is it to wield violence uh, in the service, of course, of law. Uh, in a normal state, in a normal situation, the state has this extraordinary power, which no private citizen has. No private citizen is allowed to uh, go and arrest uh, a criminal. You can't, if you see a, crime, a criminal uh, committing a crime in your street, you do not have the right as a private citizen to uh, execute the sentence of uh, imprisonment against him. If you take him prisoner uh, and lock him in your cupboard for five years, you will yourself become a criminal. But the state has that right. Uh, and it has that right. Why? Why does it have this extraordinary right? Why is the state different from ordinary citizens? Because the state enjoys this extraordinary right to wield power without possibility of legal recourse. You can't take the state to court. You can take it to court up to a certain level. But once all the um, appeals have been exhausted, all, all the possibilities of appeal have been exhausted, that's it. If you lose your final appeal at the Supreme Court or whatever, that's it. There's no further possibility of legal appeal. The state has this power and this is true, has been true, <laughs> is, a, is a true ever since humanity has existed, because the state also enjoys, or has, a very important role, a key role, a role which is definitive of civilized human life, like human life in general, which is the role of enforcing the law and of governing the territory over which it has jurisdiction. So there is a what we call a social contract. There's a social contract, as, as it were. The state enjoys this power of imprisonment or other forms of punishment because it's just the other side of the same coin. It has a duty to protect citizens from criminals. It has a duty to you know, make sure that people are not attacked in the street and all the rest of it. In international tribunals, this social contract is completely broken. It's completely broken because the international tribunals enjoy one side of the bargain. They enjoy the power to uh, pronounce uh, verdicts on people and to imprison them. But they have absolutely no responsibility for the territories over which they wield jurisdiction. And this is such a flagrant and obvious abuse of the most elementary constitutional principles that, frankly, it's incredible to me, incredible to me, that people's understanding of, as I say, constitutional principles of the most basic elements of statehood seem to be so, seems to be so deficient that they do not, as it were, rise up against these tribunals as, as flagrant examples of the abuse of power. They are tyrannical in the very literal sense of the term, in the sense that they do not uphold uh, the law uh, in any meaningful sense. They have no police, they have no powers uh, or responsibilities of government. They are not governments. And that is why, in my view, it is essential to close down these tribunals, to realize that this uh, adventure is a mistake and a very dangerous mistake because it's, it's already corrupting. The practices of these tribunals are already corrupting uh, the uh, practices in national jurisdictions. There is a a process of osmosis by which some of their worst practices, and they have very bad ones, are now being accepted in national jurisdictions as well because people say, oh, well, this is done at the International Court in The Hague, so it must be, it must be okay. Uh, can you give an example? Yes, I can give an example. Um, the um, <clears throat> uh, Yugoslav Tribunal um, <clears throat> and the Rwanda Tribunal 
and for all I know the ICC, makes very widespread use of what they call protected witnesses, of people whose identity is hidden uh, uh, from the public and possibly even from the defendants, from the defense, but certainly from the public when they um, give their evidence. Now, uh, this is a, in, in certainly in English law, and I think probably in most systems, an extremely uh, restricted right. Why is it restricted? Because uh, the view is taken that a defendant has the right to know who is accusing him and uh, that uh, accusations must be made in public uh, by the person who is making them. In other words, because obviously, you know, you don't want to facilitate uh, false accusations. You don't want to make it easier for somebody to make a false accusation. Naturally, you want, if some crime has been committed, the testimony has to be produced, but at the same time there has to be a, a protection against false accusation. Uh, but the number of protected witnesses in the Yugoslav trials is absolutely gigantic. It is no longer an exception, it's the rule. I've, again, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact figures, but in the Milosevic trial there were, I think from memory, uh, nearly 300 witnesses, and I think about half of them were protected witnesses. So this has become the rule in these tribunals. Incidentally, so has censoring the transcript, if you read the transcripts of these, and closed sessions. The, tri the tribunals are always going into closed sessions. Now, this issue of protected witnesses has now indeed started, certainly in English law, started to filter back down into national jurisdictions. And where we in Britain, uh, or I should say in England and Wales, because Scotland has a different system, uh, had uh, put very, very severe restrictions on the possibility of a witness being protected. Now that principle is being eroded. So these are technical, but very, nonetheless very important issues um, about uh, you know, how trials are conducted. So another issue is, uh, uh, but I'm, again, I'm not sure if this um, has uh, infected uh, national practices or not, but is the issue of hearsay evidence. In English law, and again, I'm, I'm, I don't know other legal systems uh, very well, but I expect the same principles exist uh, elsewhere. Certainly they should. Uh, you cannot, uh, in a criminal trial, say that, as, a, as if you're a witness for the prosecution, that you heard someone say that so-and-so did something. That is hearsay evidence. That's simply not admissible. If you say it, the judge will stop you. Uh, and, and or the, def the, the, the defense will say this is not admissible. You're simply not allowed to say it because it is irrelevant. It cannot, it's, it's irrelevant, why? Because it cannot be tested in court. If a witness says he heard his friend say so-and-so did it, that uh, is of, uh, totally useless to the court because the court cannot bring or has not brought the person who is alleged to have, to have this knowledge. A, court, a trial is like a scientific experiment. It has to be conducted in controlled circumstances. All uh, external uh, influences must be removed from the laboratory when the experiment is conducted. Otherwise, the experiment will not be valid. The same is true of a criminal trial. Uh, and uh, hearsay evidence is an example of one of these external influences that has to be excluded if the scientific uh, nature of a trial is to be preserved because a trial is a is a is a, a laboratory in which testimony is tested as much as is possible. But I mean, there are many many uh, examples of procedural abuses which I dealt with, particularly in my book on the Milosevic trial. Uh, and when you look at the uh, development of the uh, concept of the, both the laws of war and the laws of peace. Uh, from, really I would say, from the Crusades onwards, or from the end of the Crusades onwards, from the beginning of the, from the pre-modern and modern era up to the 20th century. By pre-modern I mean the, essentially the 15th century. So from the end of the Middle Ages, the beginning of the Renaissance, as we move into the modern period. Uh, you see, and this is documented by uh, those historians who have worked on the treaties and have studied them, you see that in all peace treaties, really without exception, uh, from 
I would say from the middle of the 14th century onwards, from the 1330s, 1340s, 1350s onwards. It may even be older than that, but this is when these historians have uh, identified the beginning of this uh, trend. You see that peace treaties uh, include in all cases, or effectively in all cases, amnesty clauses. So much so that, uh, according to the historians that I've quoted, the concept of amnesty, the concept of forgetting, or oblivion, as it's sometimes referred to in the texts, is inseparable from the concept of peace. So peace treaties systematically over this four or five hundred year period, up until the First World War, systematically included concepts guaranteeing amnesty. And when I say amnesty, I repeat, we mean forgetting. Amnesty, and uh, amnesis in Greek means forgetting. Anamnesis means remembering. Amnesis means forgetting. Amnesty means forgetting. So that's why the word is the word is often new, the word amnesty itself is very often not found in these treaties. It's usually, it can be found amnistia in Latin, but also the word oblivion is used. Literally, forget it. oblivion from the word to forget. Uh, and uh, this, this trend was so systematic that by the uh, 18th century, uh, and indeed by the 17th century, Grotius, uh, the great uh, theoretician of international law, uh, wrote, if I'm not mistaken, that even if an amnesty clause was not explicitly in a peace treaty, nonetheless the very concept of peace treaty implied that there would be an amnesty. It was regarded as so integral to the concept of peacemaking that even if that in some treaties it may not have been actually specifically uh, mentioned, but that was because it was in fact considered to be an integral part of it. Uh, and this uh, idea that once you've made peace, you simply have to draw a line under the past and forget about what happened earlier. This idea uh, is uh, obviously the very antithesis of the, what I call the punishment ethic of uh, modern international tribunals and indeed of much thinking about conflict and conflict resolution and the role of justice in, uh, in peacemaking. Now the view is taken, precisely the opposite view is taken, in my view wrongly, that uh, there has to be punishment and accountability and that the whole war has to be gone over and gone over and gone over in order for there to be peace. We are now uh, um, tw uh, yes, 20 years we will be, uh, we're 20 years now since the, in 2013, more than 20 years, 21 years since the outbreak of the wars in the former Yugoslavia. These wars are still being adjudicated now in The Hague, 20 years later. There's a whole generation of young people who were born in the 1990s, uh, who are now in their 20s, who have lived with nothing but, nothing but this, nothing but this almost obsessive uh, uh, concentration on these wars, which in the great scheme of things were not, in a sense, very important wars. They were not very big wars. They were obviously very horrible for those concerned, but they weren't the most important wars in the history of, uh, of humanity. Yet they have been the subject of this intense, almost obsessive judicial um, attention. And uh, as I say, I think that we need to, just as we need to abandon this false adventure of creating international tribunals because of the constitutional problems they present. So as well we must abandon this, this false punishment ethic, which in fact is only an excuse for more violence. It's an excuse for carrying on. I've said in many lectures it's the continuation of war by other means. Uh, we need to uh, have a break. We need to break with this. We need to have a rupture and get back to the tradition which is much longer and much more noble and much more beautiful, which is the tradition of saying that when there is a war, of course everybody will be, remain convinced in their 
in themselves that, you know, the other side is more guilty. But everybody knows that when there is a war, everybody commits crimes. It's the very nature of war that horrible violence is unleashed and that that violence uh, is almost by definition on both sides. And that understanding, that self-understanding, which was the cause of these amnesty clauses, that self-understanding that however much one may have been victorious or however one, one may have been conscious of the rightness of one's cause in a war, nonetheless, one knows, one may not like to say it in public, but one knows that one side has committed uh, terrible acts of violence. That self-knowledge needs to be revived because otherwise we just live in a world of violence and hypocrisy. When um, uh, Lubanga was um, uh, first discharged, uh, you may recall that he had been in prison, I think, for about two years, and then he was discharged. They, the, the judge said there's no case to answer, he should go. Uh, but the, opposite, the, pro the prosecution appealed and won, and so he's still... Um, then his trial, of course, went ahead and he was convicted. But I haven't, unfortunately, had time to follow those trials. But in my book on the Milosevic trial, the whole book is about the abuses. The, whole, the entire book, I mean, well, not every chapter, but a large number of the chapters are about the procedural abuses and the specific abuses that, uh, that he was victim of. And many of the procedural issues apply to the... Uh, to the other, both to the Arusha Tribunal and to the International Criminal Court. There was a long history of that in the Ivory Coast, which goes back way before 2011. Gbagbo was in the firing line of Western states uh, more, more or less ever since uh, 2000 when he came to power. Uh, but in the immediate uh, lead up to, well, in the year or so preceding his indictment and his transfer to The Hague, uh, the Western powers, both on their own and through the Security Council, were unequivocally in favour of uh, Ouattara uh, in the disputed election. They very explicitly, the, the, the Security Council resolution itself, if I remember correctly, pretty much explicitly, uh, I can't remember if it mentions names, but it's, everyone understands that it's saying Ouattara must be president. And certainly the French authorities, Nicolas Sarkozy and so on, said that absolutely clearly. And as we know, they then, the French forces then played a decisive role in bringing about the final uh, military denouement, which uh, of course involved the storming of the presidential palace. So that, um, the, the, the Western support for Ouattara in the disputed election was absolutely unequivocal, uh, as was then of course later the uh, ICC's concentration on uh, Bakbo as a war criminal. Well, I think he did the same thing over Libya, if I remember correctly. He, he uh, received the um, Libyan, um, what were they called, the Libyan National Council, or whatever the uh, opposition <clears throat> government was called. He received them, um, uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, before the indictment was, in, it was issued against uh, Gaddafi, and before, indeed, uh, they had been recognized by more, like more than, I think France had recognized them very early on, but he, by receiving them as if they were the government, had uh, uh, you know, very much lent his, uh, as it were, diplomatic support to, that, uh, to, to them as the legitimate government of Libya. But he was an absolute catastrophe, and uh, he was an appalling prosecutor and an appalling man, and, and, and the trial... The, the, the tribunal has been, the, the court, I should say, has been run uh, absolutely uh, in an absolutely you know, unbelievable way. I mean, it's been in existence for more than 10 years. It's only carried out one trial uh, at a cost of God knows how many hundreds of millions of dollars. I mean, it is, uh, it is um, what the Americans, I think the Americans say, a boondoggle. In other words, it's just a way for people to make money. In the United Nations, we had... Uh, uh, we had a very interesting talk by the Minister of Justice of Rwanda, who attacked the uh, Rwanda Tribunal very strongly. It was a very interesting speech because, as you know, the international community has turned against Kagame recently, if, although for years, of course, they supported him and, they, and the Arusha Tribunal, of course, supported his, uh, 
his uh, regime and his and and the the Tutsi uh, the RPF regime in in Rwanda by concentrating on the Hutu genocide. Um, now there's been a change of uh, emphasis, at least, and there have been United Nations reports attacking Rwandan, the Rwandan army for its uh, behavior in the Congo and so on. And the Rwandan government has now reacted very strongly against this and is now very critical of the, of the tribunal. But he, I mean, and so obviously there's a lot of politics involved, but he made the point that in Rwanda itself, they of course have national trials for uh, the genocide, for the Hutu genocide of Tutsis. And he said that the average cost of their trials is, I think, $50 per defendant, whereas the average cost of a defendant at the Arusha Tribunal, at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, is $20 million per defendant. <laughs> no, of course, I, 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 I firmly believe these tribunals should be closed down for all kinds of reasons, for the constitutional reasons I've mentioned, but also for what you've said. They encourage uh, this punishment ethic, because of course if people say, well, if at the international level we can do this, then let's do it at the national level. Uh, but I mean, you know, it is, it is, uh, it's a well-known principle of law, sometimes formulated as the principle of subsidiarity, but it's obviously just a matter of common sense. It's uh, it, it, it exists in the United States where, of course, crimes are always judged in the state and even in the county where they were committed. The local courts, local tribunals and so on, local juries are brought to adjudicate cases. That is a, it's a well-known principle of, of life <laughs> that things should be done as closely as possible to, to uh, the people that they concern. In international tribunals, we have had now 20 years of absurdity, uh, where, for example, in the Yugoslav tribunal, most of the lawyers, defense, or particularly the prosecution anyway, but in some cases also the defense, and certainly the judges, cannot even pronounce the names of the defendants or of the towns in which these crimes took place. The presiding judge in the Milosevic trial didn't, uh, in uh, however many years he was alive, because he died during the trial, learn how to pronounce Milosevic's name properly. Uh, and endlessly one sees the prosecutors stumbling over the names uh, of, these, um, of, of these various uh, Bosnian or, or Yugoslav villages. This is, this is ridiculous. This is a grotesque charade. Uh, this is, you know, if you like, a, an example of how stupid the whole uh, enterprise is. And that's why it has to be closed down. Well, one of the worst uh, abuses, you asked me earlier about abuses, and this is, I think, I would think this is possibly the most dangerous aspect of all uh, in international tribunals, is the role given to victims in these trials. The role given to victims has been raised now, the whole status of the victim has been raised to a, uh, what we, I don't like the expression, almost to an iconic level. It's become a, an article of faith now that victims must be given um, uh, a role in the criminal trial. There are whole departments in The Hague dealing with the victims, protection of victims. Precisely the definition of, if I may say so, Western justice, by which I mean, perhaps I shouldn't use the word Western, but the most advanced forms of justice in the civilized world precisely give no role to victims at all in a criminal trial. Why? Because the victim, or the person who thinks of himself as a victim, obviously has a desire for vengeance. And therefore his role is reduced to a minimum or zero. There is no role at all in British courts for the victims of a criminal, in a criminal trial. Uh, in s those judicial systems where the victims do have a role, we, I, we, Europeans, I certainly, regard these systems as barbaric, where precisely in that system the criminal trial is assimilated to a, uh, a civil suit. It's like an act of litigation between two parties. But in uh, civilized systems or in advanced systems, in better systems, a criminal trial is not like an act of litigation. It is not between two parties. It is, on the contrary, a prosecution brought by the state against a, a suspect.
It's a vertical relationship. It's not a horizontal relationship between two litigants. Uh, and my worry is precisely that this, uh, well, it's not a worry, I know that this uh, elevation of the role of victims, which has become an article of faith and an ideology in the international tribunals, will destroy the very concept of fair justice, of equilibrium in justice.